inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, May this never be. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were frightened of the people. Heavenly Father, we come before you and before your word in this church, the body of Christ today. We read your words, we believe them, and we ask that your spirit would teach us today through your words of what these words mean to us today and how we should respond as uh, this vineyard respond to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. October 7th, 2023. October 7th, 2023. It sounds a long time ago. But on that night, uh, soldiers from the Hamas army of Gaza came across the border and caused all kinds of trouble in the nation of Israel. They took captives, they killed people, and it was the match thrown into the gallon of gas. It sparked a war between Gaza and Israel that had been on the burner a long, long time. But the result of that has been basically the destruction of Gaza. It's, it's basically destroyed. And right now, the United Nations, uh, just this week, is, is concerned that this area of Gaza is the greatest area of hunger in the world right now. And they're trying to find ways to get food into the, the citizens of Gaza. Then, uh, uh, next, uh, Hezbollah army in Lebanon fired a bunch of missiles over the border into northern Israel. And Israel began firing their missiles back and destroying places in uh, Lebanon. And in response to that, uh, October 26th, a few weeks ago, Iran launched cruise missiles into Israel, and we kind of waited what, what was going to happen, and Israel fired all their missiles now back into Iran, and so now we're going, what, what's next? And it's, it's just escalating. And for some of us, we believe that this is the beginning of the end. Uh, some of us believe that Jesus is coming back, not in 2,000 years, but it could be today. We have not seen, I mean, Israel and Gaza and Iran have, have never gotten along, but this is the first time they're firing missiles at each other. And that the issue, the issue, the issue, uh, it's just one. Who owns the vineyard? Who owns that land that Gaza and Israel and Lebanon is on? And who owns that land? And that is the same question that the authority said when Jesus came in to Jerusalem as Messiah and the people had palm branches and they worshipped him and, and the, they said the Lord has come. And the, the, the uh, chief priests and the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day said to Jesus, you've got to stop this. The, the Romans are here. They don't want anything upsetting like this. You've got to, you've got to put this out. You've got to stop this movement that's happening today on Palm Sunday. They were concerned about that. Then the first thing Jesus did when he, when he came, came into Israel, he went straight to the temple, to the money changers. They're all outside the temple there. And people are coming for This is the week of Passover. And so people are coming and they have to offer a sacrifice. Uh, at Passover, they have to have some less blood sacrifice. Some people can only buy a pigeon. Some people buy a lamb. Some others use goats. And so they have to use the, the temple money. The temple money that's just pressed there. They come from all over the world. So money changers make a fortune that week. Exchanging uh, coins illegally, taking advantage of people, selling these, these products. They, the, the temple leaders 
make their big money. It's like Christmas shopping at Walmart. You know, this, this next couple of months, they're going to make more than they make all the rest of the year. Well, that was the temple. That was the, the people there, the money changers. And so the first thing Jesus did when he came into Jerusalem was throw these guys out of the temple. He, he, he made ropes and he, he turned over the tables. And boy, the, Phar the Pharisees and, and all of them, they were right there on Jesus. Who gave you the authority to do this? What, what right do you have to upset our money-making scheme here at the temple? And so Jesus said, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you who gave me my authority. If you'll tell me, John the Baptist, who gave John the Baptist his authority to preach and baptize out of the Jordan River? And they talked about themselves. And they said, well, if we say uh, God, then he's going to say, well, why didn't you believe him and go out and be baptized? And if we say the people, the people are going to get upset because they think he's a problem. So they, so they came back together and said, well, we won't tell you. And Jesus said, then I won't tell you about my authority either. But then what he does, what Jesus does, he's not going to tell them his authority. So what he does is tell them this parable. That's the next thing that he does. He tells this parable. And the question is, who owns this place? Who owns this temple? Who owns this city, Jerusalem? Who, who owns this place? And, and the thing that I'm excited about today is, that question needs to be asked right now. Right now. Whose church is this? Well, it's our church. Maybe we just had a business meeting. And uh, we just put money in the box. And we hired this preacher guy, and we wanted his wife, but we'll take him. It's our church. How about your life? Who owns your life? I own my life. I do what I want to do. I'm an American. I do what I want to do. Tuesday, I want to vote for whoever I want to vote for. And it's my life. And so that question, who owns the vineyard, is today's question. It's, it's being asked in Israel. They're fighting with missiles and all kinds of weapons. Some of those guys, I don't say, I don't, I don't say this, that some of those guys have nuclear weapons. I'm not going to tell you that. This is too scary. But that's what they're fighting over there, and that's the question this morning that we need to ask. Who owns the vineyard? Who owns the vineyard? When Jesus told this parable, uh, the, the Pharisees would have been very aware of Isaiah chapter 5. That's just one of the places in the prophets, where uh, they talk about the vineyard, but it's so clear here. I wanted to share Isaiah chapter 5, uh, verse 1. This is the prophet Isaiah. Uh, uh, the prophet Isaiah. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard in a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it. And cut out the wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes. But it only yielded bad fruit. And then down to verse 7. Isaiah 5 verse 7. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. And the people of Judah are the vines. He delighted in. He looked for justice but only saw bloodshed. Righteousness but only cries Distress. When Jesus told this parable about the tenants and the vineyard, the Pharisees and the religious leaders knew, it says down there, they knew Jesus was talking about them. And as we start off this morning, I want to share with you that this passage is 2,000 years old, but Jesus, through the Spirit, is speaking to you today, right now, fresh. The vineyard is the Lord's. Who owns? That vineyard. Jesus, John chapter 15, uh, brings this up to date. John chapter 15, very familiar. I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, and every branch that does not that does bear fruit will be pruned so be more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Verse 5. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. We are the vineyard. 
we are doing. And, and I want to share uh, some things about this, this parable that apply to us today. The first thing I want to share with you is God's expectation. The owner of the vineyard expects uh, grapes. He expects fruit from his, he's, he's given everything to that. He's, he's on, he owns the land. He's, he's planted the grapes. He's done everything necessary to produce grapes. And God expects fruit. That was in this, this lesson. He sent these servants to collect uh, what was owed to him. 2 Peter chapter 1 is precious. It, it's a precious chapter of the church. Peter's writing to the churches out there that are undergoing tremendous persecution. And in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, I, I hold on to this verse. Verse 3, God's divine power, listen, God's divine power has given us everything we need. Amen? Amen. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't use the word want. He didn't say anything about Amazon.com. <laughs> don't go there, man. Don't go there. They've got that loaded with stuff you want. God's power, th these are suffering churches. God's power has given us everything we need for a godly life through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory. Through these, God has given us great and precious promises. So that through them, you can participate in the divine nature. So because of this, verse 5, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, because of this, because God has given us everything we need through these promises, make every effort to produce fruit to your faith and goodness, to goodness, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, godliness, mutual affection, Mutual affection, love. Because the gardener, because the owner of the vineyard has given us everything we need, the number one thing I want to share with you is God expects us to produce fruit. What, what kind of fruit? You want to bring some grapes down here to the church? What do you want? God says he wants faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, Mutual affection and love. That's the fruit that God wants from our lives because He has provided everything we need. Uh, I'm glad my dad's not here today. He, he loved, he's always had a garden. He's had a huge garden. Then he moved where we live and he can't have a garden. But he, he, want, he has to grow okra. He has to have, he has to have fresh okra, cut up, cornmeal, some potatoes. That man, that's it. They look forward to that. So, we, uh, Judy and I made him a little garden spot. We dug up the grass, dug up the dirt, put, put all that stuff in there, got a little garden, and uh, I'm going to go to the store, I'm going to go get overseed. No, 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 I've got overseed from, from the farm. I, I want to use my overseed. That, that, that was the best okra. Okay, all right, all right. So we planted it, two little rows, planted the okra, watered it. Five little stems came up. They put out a little tiny okra and then they just sat there all summer. It was, it was the saddest thing to go over and see that. And I, I, every day I'd say, how's your okra doing? You know? uh, that was a big disappointment for my dad, for me and Judy, for the sore bones that we had. <laughs> that's, all, that's all we got. And what if my life is just a little stem with one little okra? And my Heavenly Father wants this kind of fruit in my life. Who owns the vineyard? He expects, he expects fruit. The second thing is, and I'm so thankful, that God's great patience. I'm so thankful for God's patience. Look, look at our text here, verse, verse 9. He, Jesus told a parable. The man planted a vineyard. He rented it for a long time. And harvest came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat the servant and sent the servant away, empty-handed. And so the owner sent a second servant. But they beat and they treated shamefully and sent him away, empty-handed. 
Then he sent a third servant. They wounded him and sent him out. What great patience our Father has to work with us and wait for us. And we, we have these revival moments and, and we have these revival moments and we read the Word of God and we always think, why haven't I been doing this? Or we get in a prayer meeting, we feel the Holy Spirit, why haven't I been doing this? Well, God's asking the same thing. Where's the fruit? Where's my fruit? Where's that, that love and, and hope and faith and peace that you're supposed to have? Why are we worried so much about the election? Why, are we, why do I worry so much about my parents and think about them at 3 o'clock in the morning up walking around? Why are you doing that? Where's the peace that I promised and, and given to you? The patience, the patience. On, on down in 2 Peter, we go back to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. He tells them that they want the second coming to come. They're looking for the second coming. Second Peter's all about that. Uh, when, when's Jesus coming back? This, this misery is going to end. And Peter says, don't forget this one thing. Don't, that's important. When, when the Bible says, don't forget this one thing, what in the world is, is so important? With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. Don't forget that. But I want it now. Uh, I want this resolved now. Uh, I believe I got a Bible verse here. Ask whatever you want in my name and I'll do it. <laughs> I'm waiting. I want it done now. Well, my day, my 24 hour day, is like a thousand years ago. And he has a plan. He's the vineyard. He owns the vineyard. And he wants fruit. And he's waiting for that to happen. Don't forget the Lord, the day is like a thousand years, a thousand. Years like a day, but verse 9, the Lord is not slow. See? The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. Instead, he is patient with you. He's talking about Christians. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So 2,000 years later, the people that read this, the people that read this and were waiting, were still waiting for that second coming. And Man, the signs of the times are like now. Where is Jesus? He's not slow. He's patient. He's patient. Not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. But on down in verse 10, on down in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, burn up by fire, everything will be laid bare. What kind of people ought you to be in this interim? What should you be doing? You should live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and, and speed its coming. Amen. So that's what we're doing. But who, but who owns this vineyard? Uh, when is that going to happen? I remember the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, the people were partying and Noah's building this gigantic Boat, this ark out there in the middle of the desert. Don't you know people had a ball? They, they probably had tailgate parties out there watching this thing. And drinking wine and making fun of him. And he, he would tell them what's going on. They never mentioned what Noah's wife said about all that. But I bet she wasn't welcome at the knitting <laughs> But it's just like the days of Noah. That the Jesus is coming. Destruction of the world is coming. Everything we own, everything we want, everything I bought off of Amazon.com that I had to have, it's going to be burned up. And it's coming. It's coming soon. It's coming soon. It will come. God expects fruit. He is very patient. Third, God's great love is in this story. They beat up the prophets. They kill some of the prophets. They put Jeremiah down in a well. Uh, others they chased off. All those prophets that came and preached and taught. So God said, I will send my son. It's a different category. Jesus is a different category. His disciples thought he might be a prophet like Jeremiah. Someone like that. But Jesus is the son of God. He is God. And God's great love, the uh, our text, the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw the son, 
They talked the matter over. This is the heir. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw the son out of the vineyard and they killed him. Of course, that reminds us of John 3.16. Our favorite Bible verse. The verse we learned as children and have had all through our life. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus taught. Jesus is that son. He's the son of the owner of the vineyard. And he's come and he's been cast outside and he's been killed, but he rose again, as he said he would. He's ascended into heaven, and he's coming back. That's what this uh, chapter, Luke chapter 19 and 20 is going to all be about, is his coming again. Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his love in this. God showed us his love in this. Romans 5, 8. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. And now we're justified by His blood. We're saved from God's wrath to come. And we're going to be reconciled to Him. And we boast in the Lord Jesus Christ because of this. God expects fruit. He's, he's patient. He's full of love. But number four is number four, we've got to tell people of God's coming judgment. It will come. And people are partying and buying and selling and having the greatest time of their life. And, and we've got to share with them that God's judgment is coming. In our text, the owner of the vineyard said, Luke 20, verse 13, What shall I do? I'll send my son whom I love. What then? will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when the people heard this, they said, God forbid. And people there are saying, I don't believe that stuff. I, I, don't, I just don't believe this stuff. It's not right for me. It's not good for me. I don't feel right about it. That's the, that is not going to matter when Jesus comes back. He's coming. He's going to judge this world. And Judgment was pronounced on Jerusalem in AD 70, 70 AD. Titus, the Roman general, came, came and they tore that temple down, rock by rock, leveled, killed those priests, killed all the white people. <coughs> and now, today, do you know what's there on the temple? <laughs> do, you, do you know in Jerusalem, on the temple grounds, uh, do you know that temple place? Do you know what's Built there right now? A mosque. <laughs> a mosque to pray to Allah. Mm -hmm. God's judgment is real and it's coming again. We look back and say, well, that's, that, that's ancient history. No, it, it, what if it were today? Are you ready? Are you ready for that? This church is not my church. Uh, this church. This isn't my church. This Baptist thing isn't my thing. It's the Lord's church. This is the body of Christ. And I am not my own. That's very un-American. I'm not a communist. I'm a Christian. And this, this body belongs to the vineyard owner. I'm just the tenant using it. He expects fruit. He's patient. He has great love. He's going to come in judgment. But one last thing. Almost out of time. One last thing. One last wonderful thing. Jesus <coughs> will be triumphant. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> can't close about that. Look, look, look at our text. Uh, verse 17. Jesus looked directly at them and said, uh, What then is the meaning of this? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces and crushed. That's from Psalm 118, verse 22. Jesus quoted Psalm 118, verse 22, and he said to them, I am the cornerstone. The cornerstone. 
He, he doesn't tell him, I'm, I'm the grapevine. I'm, I'm the grapevine. He says, I'm the cornerstone. And the cornerstone is used to build a new building. That's what the cornerstone is for. He said, he's a rock, a little rock. But you, you use a, a cornerstone. Jim uses these all the time. He has them in the back of his truck. A cornerstone. Is the, is the squared off stone and you set it exactly how you want the building and it determines the new building. Jesus is the cornerstone. He told them told that on that last week of his life and they crucified him. They crucified the cornerstone. Psalm 118 says the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. It's marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God. He has made light shine on us with boughs in hand. Join the festival procession up to the altar. You are my God. I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. Amen. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you. We thank you that Jesus told this parable. And Father, we, we know exactly who you are talking to. We know exactly who you're talking about. The chief priest knew you were talking about them, and this morning we know you're talking about us. Father, if there's anyone here who has not made that decision yet, we pray that your spirit will draw each of them to turn over their lives to Jesus Christ, who's coming in in victory. For the rest of us who, who have received you as Savior and declared you as Lord, Father, find us thankful and grateful and busy living holy lives as we wait for you. We can only do this in the power of your Holy Spirit living within us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.